the night was darkly starlit and the wind came weaving in like a poor lonesome sailor man a cast upon the sand up the old embarcadero and down the port again we're leaving san francisco in the morning on departure day the men gathered on the docks of san francisco it was a festive occasion the italians arrived with jugs of wine and the Scandinavians brought moonshine. Wives and sweethearts came to bid their men farewell. President Portman was always on hand. There were tears and laughter. Aboard ship, the carpenters secured the anchors, locked the windlass, plugged the hawse pipes, and fired up the donkey engine. It was important to have the donkey engine ready to handle the heavy work of raising sail in case the men were too drunk or too seasick. Feel the heart of those who steal away to sea For a heart that loves the ocean's been forlorn eternally And we're leaving San Francisco in the morning The carpenters also busied themselves building additional bunks and galleys for the cannery hands. You have to remember that these ships were outfitted to carry anywhere from 70 to over, way over 100 people. They had to have bunks for them, they had to have uh, cooking facilities, they had to have sanitary facilities, they had to have a large water supply. They didn't need oil because they were sailing. The voyage to Alaska was a difficult journey through waters often shrouded in fog and lashed by storms. Sometimes the ships took a coastwise route calling on Puget Sound ports for lumber and coal, or ferrying supplies to and from the APA canneries at Point Roberts and Semiamu. Bird Isaacson remembers their visits. But I remember the Star of Lapland came in here lots of times. They'd load up supplies going north, then they'd bring fish coming back. Well, they came in every, every summer ahead of the canning season, bringing up the stuff that we needed, you see. Other ships bound for Alaska took the direct route through open ocean. For roughly a month, they beat northward against the westerly wind. At sea, the races were kept largely separate. The races were divided, uh, and for a good reason. Uh, lifestyles were considerably different. The Chinese cannery hands were confined to the Chinese quarters in the tween deck generally in the tween deck, which is the next deck down from the main deck, the weather deck. That reporter you told me about was right when he said it was a tough proposition to go to Alaska in the China gang. We had about 50 Chinamen and about 45 Mexicans on the ship we went up on. They all stayed together in a little cubby hole in the forward part of the ship, their meals consisting of beans and rice, a little dry bread and tea was cooked up on deck and each man had his own tin plate and knife and fork and came up on deck at mealtime and got his rations of a big pot to eat it wherever he could find a place on deck, no matter what the weather is, snow, rain, or sunshine. And each man washed his plate of a tub of seawater they had for that purpose. The Italians and the Scandinavians generally stayed in the old customary foxels, the deck houses, and maybe some of the afterquarters. The diets were different. You can't feed Europeans a Chinese diet, and the Chinese wouldn't eat a European diet. But yes, the lifestyle was different, and uh, sad to say, the Chinese were treated pretty much as second-class citizens. Tradition says that in case the ship was sinking at sea, the China gang would be locked down in the hold, or where they stay and let go down with the ship without any chance to save themselves. I well believe it is true, because there's not enough lifeboats to hardly take care of the white crew, not alone the Chinese and Mexicans, and some of them lifeboats haven't seen water for at least 15 to 20 years. The ships that ventured to the northern canneries sailed through Unimac Pass, where strong headwinds and tidal currents tested the abilities of the masters. Greenhorns, making their first trip, got the Unimac Pass shaved. Once they had crossed the Aleutian chain, the ships turned eastward, bound for Bristol Bay. Sometimes the Bering Sea greeted them with ice. 
This afternoon we have the most beautiful picture to look upon that man ever saw. Bristol Bay is as smooth as a mill pond. The sun is out. The atmosphere is clear for miles and miles. Some thin fog hovering in spots over the land. And also in the far distance, chunks of ice ranging from the size of a man's head to chunks that would take three or four hours to walk around. In Bristol Bay, the sailing ships met a waiting tug or steamer and were towed closer to shore and anchored for the summer. In late June or early July, the fishing began. Propelled by sails and heavy oars, flotillas of Columbia River boats dispersed over the fishing grounds. The huge red salmon runs lasted for only two or three weeks, and the harvest was intense. The fishermen only got small sailboats, about 25 feet in length, and fish with a gill net, two men to a boat. Do their cooking right on the boat. Not allowed to come ashore except for provisions. Got to stay out there in any kind of weather. Believe me, they earn every dollar they get. Axel Wiederstrom. They would come into the tenders uh, up in Alaska, barely afloat, and occasionally not afloat. <laughs> And uh, the guys lived out on the boats for days on end. The tugs would tow them out to the fishing grounds, long strings of these sailboats, cut them loose, and they'd go out and do their fishing. And the guys would live out here in these, underneath these little canopies with a little Swede stove and, and uh, a box of groceries that they'd picked up from the cannery. And that's the way they lived, damp and cold. But uh, they were making money hand over fist. He said when they came home in the in closing period, they're all black from their little stove and the hard life. The sailboats offloaded their catches at tally scows, where the fish were counted so that each fisherman could be paid according to his production. Of course, there's a lot of crooked work about that, like everything else there. For instance, some of them pay the tally man some percentage of how much overcount he gives them. So if you see, there's many a scow load comes in which is reported by the tallymen to have about 80 or 90,000 fish. But in reality, they only have 70,000 or less. And each fisherman, it's six cents a piece for his season's catch. So the company is cheated out of thousands of dollars every year that way. But nobody is worrying about the company as they get more fish than they can handle there anyhow. Such is life in the far north. I hope I never have to go up there again. <laughs>